And now the official welcome to everybody at today's Impact for Breakfast session. For those who are joining us for the first time, I'm Deborah Keller and I manage the Global Impact for Breakfast Network. IFB is an initiative supported by Artha Impact, which is the impact investing arm of the Rianta Capital Family Office. Impact for Breakfast is an informal network of family offices, foundations, funds, venture philanthropy, and intermediary organizations with a common interest in social enterprise, entrepreneurship, and impact investing. The specialized group has been gathering and growing since 2008, starting in London with an expansion today to multiple cities around the globe. Today, we will explore a recently released report that couldn't be more relevant to our times. Digital Delivery, a digitalization guidebook for enterprise support organizations. The aim of the report and of this IFB session is to help organizations think through what levels of digitalization make sense going forward and how to make the best use of digital tools. Enhance service delivery, improve access, reduce costs, and contribute to organizational sustainability. And for that, we have with us today three organizations with uh, three different digital archetypes that will join the conversation and share their stories of how they have digitized their services, how COVID may have accelerated that process, and what role digital delivery will play as we emerge from pandemic. Before we start, I want to inform you that this session is being recorded. We'll share the link uh, to the recording with you all in a follow-up email, which you are welcome to share with your network or colleagues. As always, we welcome your thoughts, comments, ideas, and questions also during the presentation. We've planned dedicated Q&A slots after each presentation. If you think of a question uh, for any of our speakers, you're welcome to type it into the chat field. We will try our best to cover all of them. And now, with no further ado, over to you, Harry. The stage is yours. Thanks very much, Deborah. Uh, thank you for having us. And uh, I think the first Impact for Breakfast meeting I attended was uh, Shell Foundation in London about seven years ago. But uh, it's great to be here with uh, all of you who have made it um, in today's meaning of the word. I'm particularly excited to be moderating a group of fantastic organizations we have the joy of working with. And I'm looking forward to the conversations and questions that the uh, presentations on their approaches will, will spark. So I'm going to provide a, a background. I'm going to just briefly define the topic and the objectives and, and a bit of background on what we found. And then I'm going to uh, hand over to those three organizations. Uh, and as Deborah said, there'll be time for Q&A um, interspersed throughout. So please do get your questions in the chat box and, uh, and we've, we've got various sections to come to them. So uh, as a bit of very brief background, my name's Harry. I'm the uh, learning and evaluation manager at Argidius. Argidius is a private Swiss foundation. We're part of Porticus, which advises the charitable entities of the Brennickmar family. Uh, Argidius seeks to catalyze entrepreneurship in developing countries such that small firms are able to better grow, create employment, become more productive and tackle poverty. Uh, one of the, I mean, we work solely really with intermediaries, so organizations that themselves support entrepreneurs. Each of those organizations might support anywhere between 10 and several thousand entrepreneurs each year. And we've got about 50 of these partner organizations. Now, we're really focused on each partner uh, and each project. We're really focused on understanding what is it that really helps enterprises to grow and create jobs? How can that be done cost effectively? And how can that be done in a way that the organizations delivering that can sustain themselves, whether that's through attracting funding or 
generating revenue or a blend of both. To this end, we've been testing out digital approaches and helping organizations or supporting organizations that are interested in testing different approaches of deliver delivering services to entrepreneurs. These services uh, typically might involve like accelerate, might be acceleration, mentoring, some sort of investment with non-financial support uh, embedded within it, um, networking, management training, this kind of thing. And, and we've been testing digital approaches and I'd say we're relatively early in that journey, but along came COVID and it really accelerated that trend. Uh, and, and we were hearing from a number of partners that this was a, you know, was a timely and uh, challenging topic. How do we best digitalize our services in this context? Um, so we commissioned Dalberg to conduct a study to identify what are the current practices and opportunities that digitalization brings. Um, and, and, and they found that interestingly, you know, we've moved from about 25% of services overall uh, in, in the 40 organizations uh, involved in that study, uh, about 25% of the services were delivered digitally uh, before the pandemic, that jumped to 75% uh, in November. Overall, that might scale back a bit to about 60%. So digital, as we emerge from the pandemic, digital will play more of a role, um, but there's great variation. So there seem, there's, there's a section of organizations where actually digital well, in-person delivery will be the primary way of achieving their um, strategic objectives and, and outcomes. Um, there's a group who have either before COVID they're digitalizing or, or, or because of COVID they digitalize and they actually found that they can effectively um, achieve their outcomes, more effectively achieve their outcomes with digital means playing a more central role. These are what, what, what the term transform organizations and that there are, there's a subsection of organizations where digital strategy has, is, is particularly central and they're exploring different ways in which digital delivery can uh, achieve learning outcomes. How can it uh, transform how people are learning online? I'm going to, uh, you know, this is where the participants in the call are really gonna color this in and we're gonna find out what that looks like. Um, there is a guidebook that's been developed that the idea is really to help organizations think about what level of digitalization makes sense for you and, and, here, are, and, and here are some, some tips to do so. And, and that's really what we're going to try and achieve in this call is that I, I'd really like everyone to leave with a sense that there's, there's no single pathway that's the right one for all organizations, but rather different pathways can be more effective for helping different organizations achieve their goals. And this will depend on the organizational context, strategy, and capacities. Um, so without further ado, Pablo. Um, Pablo is the CEO and founder of Bridge for Billions. Pablo, please introduce yourself and tell us about um, why, why you're focusing on digital uh, what this looks like in terms of your services and what you've learned along that way in terms of successes and challenges. Perfect. Thank you so much, Harry, uh, for having me. Uh, well, I'm Pablo Sandofemia. I'm the co-founder and CEO of, of Bridge for Billions. For those of you who, who don't know uh, Bridge for Billions, we define ourselves as a, as a network, as an ecosystem of entrepreneurship and innovation programs. So we, we build programs with all kinds of partners. Uh, we build programs with uh, large corporations, identifying innovations within their value chains. We also support different entrepreneurs that are um, you know, along the, the, the priority lines of, of large companies um, you know, for, the, for social impact. And also we, we work with foundations, with universities. And since almost two years ago, we also work with governments and, and development agencies. Just in a, in a nutshell, um, Bridge for Billions today has supported more than 1,900 1, entrepreneurs. Um, we have uh, 1,900 alumni. 
uh, supported probably many more, um, but the, the numbers that I always like to highlight about Bridge for Billions that always make me really proud is that around 46% of our founders are women founders. We know that the ecosystem is extremely not uh, inclusive, not very meritocratic, unfortunately also. And the numbers um, for women uh, entrepreneurship support tends to be something even between the 10 and 20% of, of women founders in traditional programs. Um, and then in terms of impact, like real impact, um, so out of the 88% of the entrepreneurs that complete one of our programs, around 70% um, are still active after two years. And the... I think the, the main differentiation of Bridge for Billions is that w all the programs that we built are in the incubation phase. So we do not focus on ideation, neither we focus on the acceleration, the growth stage. We focus on the middle part, which we, we believe that uh, it's kind of uh, relatively comparable to the challenge that we see in the missing middle. So within the entrepreneurship journey, the missing uh, middle uh, is the incubation stage. There is not a lot of support. Um, so in terms of um, how Bridge for Billions was born and, and probably focusing more on the pathway, the digitalization pathway that we took. So uh, I started Bridge for Billions when I was a, a master's student uh, in the US um, at Carnegie Mellon. And Carnegie Mellon uh, was the, also the, the, bed, the, the, the place where Duolingo was born. And I was very inspired by Duolingo this app to learn a language. Um, but I didn't really feel the problem that Duolingo was solving. For me, my problem was uh, there is a lack of meritocracy, there is a lack of inclusivity uh, in the entrepreneurship ecosystems. A lot of incubation acceleration programs want to support many more entrepreneurs, but they don't do it mostly because the cost per entrepreneur is really high for business development uh, support organizations. So therefore, they have to support very few. So there is there was this this challenge of quality or quantity. And my background, I'm an engineer, and I was like, okay, this is something that engineers we can solve. We can try to find a model for quality and quantity. So looking and focusing on on Duolingo, I started understanding that you know technology and you know learn by doing pedagogies could really enhance the the you know the process for an entrepreneur to basically get what they really needed the structure the the challenging the mentoring that they needed in those initial stages so how did we start because bridge for billions we were born digital because of the problem that we were trying to solve we were trying to enhance the the efficiency of many of the entrepreneurship programs that we were seeing so it was not that COVID made us digital, we were digital already, and also we were a remote company. So when COVID happened, fortunately, uh, for us, uh, not that when COVID happened, fortunately, when, when COVID happened, we were fortunately very prepared. We, it was a, a privilege for us to continue as if nothing had happened. Um, so just to, to explain more of how we started and why we, we digitalized and the, the steps that, that we took, um, I started first, and in the report that Harry mentioned, uh, we explain it in, mo in more detail, but I, I started first with research, understanding numbers, understanding the system, understanding the different incubators and accelerators challenges. Myself, I went through a few incubators and accelerators with Rich for Billions as a, as a company, also experienced it firsthand, and we started understanding those bottlenecks. From a process, you know, design point of view, where were the pro the bottlenecks of entrepreneurship programs? From there, we started applying a lot of the design research methods, so like interviewing, shadowing, uh, doing basically all the different ways to understand our customers, and our customers were organizations that were building entrepreneurship programs. From there, we analyzed and followed. Um, more of this human-centered design process where we co-created our platform. Initially, it wasn't really a platform. It was all on Google Drive. So we put uh, every user had a folder and it had their name. Um, users were entrepreneurs and mentors. And then uh, every entrepreneur had their profile, uh, mentors had their profile, and then we generated another folder, which was the journey for, for the entrepreneurs to go through. 
one of the things that we realized very early on is that the something we believe the main challenge for entrepreneurs is to connect to support and in the case of mentoring is to connect with mentors but the challenge uh, with with mentoring is that connecting is just is not enough you really need to guide that interaction so that's where we brought the technology and we said okay if we connect if we generate a learning journey online step by step where the entrepreneurs are mimicking what they will do in a physical space where you know a guru or a, a teacher a professor comes in and explains we flipped it and say okay what are the learning steps that entrepreneurs need to go through can we replicate that back then was in a google drive um, we generated all the steps entrepreneurs will have to complete that uh, step by step via google drive uh, mentors could come in and provide comments and this process just with Google Drive validated that we could train and mentor entrepreneurs online. We started with mentors, with entrepreneurs from Mexico, from Ghana, from Spain and the US. And we, we always had this thing in mind, which is if you design for the extremes, you design for all. So we had entrepreneurs that were extremely highly educated with 24 hours access of internet and then entrepreneurs that might, did not have access to internet uh, weekly. Um, and that might, might or might have not had um, university degrees, for example. With, with this in mind, from there, we started um, building. So this was, we had already done close to 15 pilots and we first built our first MVP, the platform. From that, we continue uh, for a year. We supported 120 entrepreneurs. We did another iteration. So improving the methodology, it was a very, step-by-step uh, -step approach. So every feedback that the entrepreneurs and the mentors were giving us, we will be embedding it into our methodology and our, um, you know, the, the dashboard, the features and all of that. And it wasn't really until the third version that we decided, okay, we've learned for three years a lot of, you know, what has happened. So then we decided to basically build a new platform from scratch with a new language. We had, we were working with Google's Angular and we moved to Facebook's uh, React. And there it was really the game changer because we built, you know, the platform of Bridge for Billions more in a systemic way, uh, understanding all the challenges that we had seen for entrepreneurs, mentors, and organizations using our platform. And that's really the result of what happened in 2019. So for 2020, we were ready for, for expansion and then COVID happened. So when COVID occurred, one of the things we realized, and I'll just want to share this because it was, it was the realization that we were extremely privileged. Um, we, we saw that a lot of the entrepreneurship programs and as Harry was mentioning, did not really have any tools um, to digitalize and they were trying to do it really fast. So what happened to many programs is that they basically got postponed or many times they even canceled. So we launched an initiative called Together for Innovation. So basically we open Bridge for Billions to any uh, you know, business support organization free of charge um, to, to launch programs. And one of the things we saw, which has been a pivotal moment for Bridge is that within three weeks, we had close to 13 organizations from different parts of the world um, supporting 270 entrepreneurs at once for during the month of April, May, and June of 2020. And that's where we saw, okay, we definitely have something that can be replicated. Uh, at that time was also the moment that we, we had received the generous support of Argidius to expand to Central America. And the two things really helped us come up or, or discover our new model, which is no longer, I mean, we still do programs, but we're focusing more and then thinking about the future. It's not so much just building the programs that we do um, with organizations, but actually supporting local uh, entrepreneurship support organizations to digitalize their offerings. And not just from a digitalization point of view, uh, but as we say, like we go into the kitchen, we go into understanding, you know, the revenue streams, their costs, and we try to support them so that they become more sustainable. In a sense, we help them decrease their costs and increase their revenue streams so that they can themselves become more uh, sustainable and support more entrepreneurs. So at the end, like well, one of the things we want to do is to share what we've learned. We know that we can achieve quality and quantity, and that's really the future for, for us in, in Bridge for Billions. 
Um, and just in, a, in I'll, I'll leave it here, but one of the things also we're realizing is we were 100% online and now we're starting to move offline with these ecosystem building initiatives, with community and an ambassador's programs so that we can connect the two worlds. And I'll leave it here, Harry, thank you so much. Thanks Pablo for that uh, great whistle-stop tour of what you're doing. Um, some of the things that just kind of struck me from that was the really customer-centric approach you took uh, in designing and, and iterating that constant loop of feedback um, this concept of designing for, for, for the extremes, you design for all. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. But, but before I sort of tuck into any questions that, that I have, um, I'd just like to open it up to, to all the participants. Um, please do raise your hand or, or put questions in the chat um, for Pablo. Um, <clears throat> Otherwise, I'll, I'll kick off with some of, some of my questions. So uh, while those come in, Pablo, um, this designing for, for different people, you mentioned that you've been very successful with, with uh, in, in terms of gender, in terms of getting quite good gender balance there. Uh, and then you mentioned designing for the extremes. What, what are some of the considerations that you that, that you needed to think about to do that and, and what does that look like? So um, in, in design school, uh, like professors always say that the design phase is the phase that it's the most malleable, is the one that has, you can have the highest influence of change, but also is the cheapest. So when, when you design uh, for the extremes, you're really projecting all potential scenarios uh, with paper or with a PowerPoint or just a, a rough uh, sketch uh, of your of your application. If you if you devote a lot of time in those initial stages, but it's not just like showing it to other people, but actually testing it with rough prototypes, uh, you can really see that the extremes. It, there is always a spectrum. Like I was talking about educational. Um, you know, level, but also access to internet, or also, you know, um, profit making, all of these are spectrums. And if you start thinking, okay, I want to design for, and we, we did pilots with nonprofits, with le like legal entities that were nonprofits, but also really uh, want to be unicorn entrepreneurs. So by designing for the extremes, you, you ensure that you are going to identify things that if you de designed for the majority, then you wouldn't. So this is at the design stage. However, <laughs> at the launching stage, you do need to design and actually implement for the majority because the extremes will come later. But because you've done all that mapping initially, it's so much easier to start improving and ensuring that you know step 17 is not gonna be in a position of with the step two that you do. Um, and then the other thing that also we, we did, so this is designed for the extremes, but also designed for the future. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend this to everyone, but designing for the future for us meant designing for, so we started in 2013, designing uh, Bridge for Billions for a world in 2017 or 2020, where we believe that internet penetration was gonna be uh, already a reality in most, in most countries. And one of the, and that organizations were gonna see entrepreneurship as a need for economic development, uh, not just some organization, but it was gonna be a mainstream. And designing again for the future really helped us uh, be ahead. However, in the initial stages makes it also very difficult because you're designing for a world that maybe doesn't exist yet. That's, uh, that's fascinating. And, and so in that designing, just picking out one more time on those, you know, how did you think about these these different extremes? Were there any tools or, 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 or things that you used to really help you understand those different customers? So the, the, um, the tools that we used were design research methods. So um, I, identifying that there are plenty of design research methods. I recommend there is a great book, 101 Design Research Methods. But basically uh, from the traditional surveying and, 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 and interviewing, to actually doing focus groups or potentially doing 
um, you know, uh, for us, for the digital part, we we did we did recordings for people using the platform. Um, we did we also looked at um, you know competitive and, um, solutions in other industries. Basically, it was really trying to to understand the users' use of what will be Bridge for Billions in you know in, in a year or two years later. Okay, great. We also um, have questions in the chat field, Harry. Um, Raki, um, do you want to share the question yourself? We also have one from Karina. You're also welcome to unmute yourself and share the question yourself with Pablo. You see me all right? Yes. Yeah. Hello, Pablo. Thanks for the outline and maybe I missed a point. I was inquisitive to know as you have delivered and your experience, other than the extremes that Harry mentioned, have there been demand or requests for actually customizing uh, content? And I share this because of our experiences is that we sort of launched like, like you with, on a Google Drive on an Excel sheet. And then we realized that the demand for customization from different audiences kept growing. And we were sort of trying to understand when do you stop that development process mm. and say, this is call and these are the additional features. So both from a product uh, design and service yep. perspective, but also from working with different targets. Thank you. So th this was very, this was the case, especially initially when we started, um, like I'm 31 years old. So uh, I started with 20, when I was 24. And I have to say that initially a lot of organizations were telling us, no, I want it X, I want this and want that. And it wasn't really until we had validated impact that we said our methodology works. And it's not that it works because we, you know, uh, discover the, the, the wheel, but um, we took the methodology or we got inspired by the methodology of discipline entrepreneurship out of MIT. And then we did a lot of testing with entrepreneurs that were not students from MIT. And so the, the faults, the, the challenges of that methodology and kept improving it for with more than 300 entrepreneurs until we said, okay, this works. And after that, by locking the methodology in a sense, uh, the content, we said, okay, this is not that people can customize or not, they can complement. But what I wouldn't want is that people, the organizations that they want to do, you know, step three before step two or whatever it is, they will, you know, change it without understanding the impact that we had validated by having support, having supported many, many entrepreneurs. So I will say it was probably the confidence in, like you probably need to stop when, when you already have the confidence that what you do works, but you also need to leave a room, like room for complementing, um, which is different, which is slightly different from customization because you still keep the core, but then you're adding different layers. In Bridge, many times we talk about the burger so we, we sell you the burger, but you can put the avocado, you can remove the cheese, you, but it's still the burger. Um, and that's when, um, but I will say only impact and um, yeah, impact can really tell you when to stop. I don't know if I answered. No, that, it's really that there's no definite answer in that and you sort of have to get that core going. Just a, a follow-up question. When you say that the burger and the ingredients can work around, is that been, because I've seen your offering has expanded, how easy has it been to collaborate to get the other pieces going? Or have you had to develop that internally to complement the digital tools? Because then you end up starting with a focus, but then having to um, develop other tools, which probably are better through collaboration or integration. So we always say that anyone, any partner, mentor, entrepreneur in Bridge can advise us to change something. And we're going to study that immediately. Uh, so we are always open to looking for, for new ways. So that's actually the crowdsource way of, for us to improve. However, there, is, there are some, I wouldn't say red lines, but there are some focus lines, which for us is incubation, for example. So we do not support entrepreneurs that are at the growth stage, neither at the ideation stage. We started to complement things in the offline space. So offering materials before and after. Now in the community, we also offer a lot of different um, you know, services that are not really the core. Um, so, but I think it's necessary to put some sort of boundaries um, to, to really ensure that you're not 
basically a digital provider. Um, this is this was not our focus uh, to just be a digital provider, but to actually build you know uh, programs and support entrepreneurs. Thanks for that great question, questions, Raki and uh, Derek and Karina. Thanks for the questions. We'll try and loop back to them later, but I, I do want to make sure everyone that there's good time for for each of the presenting organisations. So, um, over to Somo. Um, Lorreen is the operations manager and training lead at, at Soma Africa. Charles is uh, the tech lead and one of the acceleration catalysts. And uh, Lorreen, Charles, uh, over to you. Really looking forward to hearing about um, your, who Somo are, what role digital delivery plays in serving your clients and uh, what you've learned along the way. Thanks, Harry. Hi everyone. Um, like I said, my name is Lorreen and I work at SOMO as an operations manager. Um, and I'll be doing our, our piece with um, Charles. So maybe Charles can introduce yourself, then we can proceed. Yeah, there he goes. Hi everyone. My name is Charles Juma, uh, tech lead at SOMO Africa and also observation coordinator. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Charles. Um, so maybe a bit of introduction, if maybe someone is hearing about SOMO for the first time. Uh, we were established in 2016, um, and SOMO is a business accelerator. We support social entrepreneurs working to transform low-income communities by providing them with business training, funding, market access for their products and services, and we also provide tailored advising and mentorship for our entrepreneurs. So we work here in uh, Kenya, we are across three cities, that is Nairobi, Mombasa, and in Kisumu, and our target audience is informal settlements. So we have one um, a training program, uh, Somo Capital, which is where we invest, and we also provide market access. So for our training program is our focus um, today where we run two different kinds. One is called Burukana Somo, which is a 12 week program. Entrepreneurs go through a 12 week training and at the end of the 12 weeks, they're able to um, apply to get into our accelerator. And then we partner with them for a period of two years. Um, our second program is called Boost Business Somo. It's also a training program, but it came up out of a need in the communities we work in where a lot of the um, smaller businesses around our communities were not able to qualify for our Buruka program because for our Buruka program, we work with impact entrepreneurs. So we came up with a basic business training where these entrepreneurs could be able to access the skills that they needed to run their small businesses. Um, so it's a much more basic program than Buruka. And also the focus is not on impact entrepreneurs. We, we do this to be able to provide skills for the people who work in the areas we um, our offices are based in. Um, so yeah, after that, they, they can qualify to join our accelerator uh, where we provide the business coaching and um, ag market access. So market access can be the online shop, Somo has physical stores, and we also do flea markets uh, for the entrepreneur's products and services. So for our digitization journey, um, we, we call it DigiSomo. We play with the word DG a lot in the in the digitization program. So we call it as a whole DigiSomo. And in DigiSomo, we have three kinds of um, content. So we have DigiMessage, DigiVoice, and we have DigiVideo. Um, we initially started with DigiMessage. Um, definitely, we had been thinking about digitizing our content, but COVID definitely accelerated that journey because we had started um, sometime in February last year leading into March, which is around that time we went into lockdown. But at that time we had already partnered with um, Arifu. I saw someone asking about co-creation with a partner and for us uh, it was Arifu that provided us with a chatbot platform. So we partnered with Arifu and their, their team um, helped us to digitize the content in terms of our, our, our in-person content uh, was quite wide um, because we, you know, we had quite a lot of time to be able to meet with the entrepreneur and work with them step by step. But with Arifu, we were able to um, sort of 
compress that content into messages so such that someone can be able to access it on their WhatsApp as a chatbot and also on SMS. Um, and that was very successful, I, I'd, I'd say. It's um, working quite well. We're able to do gamified quizzes with our content such that after an entrepreneur goes through the content, they're able to take a quiz um, and it makes the content that much more interesting. However, along the journey, we realized that for um, our audience, like our boost based participants, a lot of the business owners didn't have smartphones um, because of the kind of businesses they were in, but also just the, the nature of our target audience. And so we decided to do um, IVR content. So again, um, our training team came together. We um, made scripts for IVR content, and then we got someone uh, who's a voice artist to help us record the content. So DigiVoice is accessible on any phone, whether it's a basic feature phone or a smartphone. And we, you can dial it on your phone as a toll-free number, and you're able to listen into the content for the Boost Biz curriculum for the entrepreneurs. So they dial the number and they're able to listen in to the content. Um, the other content that we have done over time and we are still doing is DigiVideo. So DigiVideo, um, is our YouTube. So it's basically videos uh, and we have uploaded them on YouTube. Before this, we had content on Google Classroom, um, but it was not easily accessible. We wanted to make our content accessible to the wider audience. And so we moved our content to YouTube. And so if you search SOMO on YouTube, you're able to access our entrepreneurship content. Um, and so this, we got an illustrator to help us with um, just uh, visualizing of the content and then our trainers are the other ones who recorded the content so if you go on your youtube channel you'll be able to see that so that's basically um what we majored in in our digitization of our training content we also have um Digikua and charles is one of the developers or the key developers actually help us to develop Digikua. and i will maybe give him a chance to present on Digikua. um that's that has ever since um, evolved uh, from what we had before in our data tracking um, system. Thanks, Lori, uh, for that uh, opportunity. Yeah, so once again, my name is Charles, and uh, Digicua is a USSD and WhatsApp based uh, record keeping tool uh, that is used by entrepreneurs to, to submit their business records. And then over time, of course, they can be able to. Uh, uh, the, the data that they have submitted to be able to, yeah, that they have submitted to be able to either get additional funding or just for them uh, key business decisions. So it was just in 2020 when COVID had just hit, and then uh, you know the way we used doing our presentation, it was more of uh, I mean the the reporting it was more. Of, uh, entrepreneurs coming to the hub and then using the hub computers and also the internet to be able to do the reporting. So it was not more frequent, it was maybe during once a month. Uh, so uh, with the new rules, the new COVID rules and the social distancing and lockdown, so we had to find ways to be able to ensure that still uh, entrepreneurs could be able to uh, do their reports. And also, as just Lorena said, uh, based on our target market, uh, I mean, our target audiences, it's, it's not like uh, they have smartphones or uh, computers that they can be able to do, and also internet access is an issue. So we had to settle on technologies that uh, the entrepreneurs could still be able to access. And uh, one of the, the technologies was the USSD, which is more of maybe how they usually purchase their credit or maybe accessing mobile banking. So we thought, ah, if we use this kind of technology, then it means they still be able to, uh, to have access to be able to do reports. So we created Digico as a USSD first, and then so we connected to update their Google Sheets, uh, which uh, that, that is what we usually use, uh, the Google Sheets to store their uh, cash flow records. Yeah, so over time, uh, we realized that those, those businesses which have put more products and then also uh, some had smartphone access, and uh, we thought, okay, it would be easier also maybe uh, to see how they could also be able to use their smartphones to be able to uh, update their records. So one main thing that uh, we didn't uh, want to look into was uh, uh, getting another tool maybe they have to download, uh, because our key, our, 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 our main, uh, what we've been looking into was at least just trying to use uh, the technologies that is already existing. So one thing we thought uh, WhatsApp could be a good thing 
and uh, we connected it so that uh, Digico was available on WhatsApp and uh, USSD. So if you have a smartphone, you can still be able to uh, submit your records uh, to uh, the your Google Sheet, and then over time you can be able to use it. So of course now for that now we came and then these records, and then now started to create. Uh, uh, a dashboard where at least now can get the different profiles where uh, uh, investors could come in, uh, have a look at it, and then it will be more at least they can be able to use uh, these records that they're keeping over time to be able to uh, either get additional fundings, yeah, or interested people. Yeah, so that's on uh, Digicoa. Uh, so it's been a challenge, uh, but it's been moving along uh, well. So I'm going to uh, Request maybe if you have any, any questions with regards to maybe what Lorena said or uh, what I've uh, said, uh, it's welcome. Yeah. Thanks very much, Charles and Loreen. Um, a couple of points that really stuck out to me were around how you know you you have this segmented program offering, how you needed to how you were well, COVID accelerated this transition to getting your content online and you developed a suite of different tools to uh, um, meet the needs of those different clients that you work with. Uh, there were some interesting references of how you're you know, primarily using available tools, although very interestingly built your own tool for record keeping. Um, and, you know, I've got various questions, but there's there's one that's coming from, from Reem. Um, so, Reem, would you be able to un unmute yourself and uh, and share your question? Hello, everyone. Um, hi. So, hi, thank you again for your presentation. Uh, my question was, how do you make sure you reach this target audience? Uh, because from my understanding, they're not the first users of digital tools or smartphones. So basically the change was made during COVID. How did you make sure to, how did you reach to them and onboarded them? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Rim. Um, so our, we have outreach ambassadors. Okay, I think, okay, two pieces. One is how we onboarded them during COVID when we were working online. And so for this, we have outreach ambassadors in the communities that we work with. So that those are still based in those communities and they would be able to advertise our program. However, during COVID, we heavily used um, online platforms. So our Facebooks, um, Instagram, basically our social media pages, but also our entrepreneurs, um, a lot of them are on WhatsApp as well. So they would be able to share out um, details of our training program. They will be able to share out with the various groups they are in. Um, apart from the outreach ambassadors who are already based in the communities that we work in. Um, about training them how to use and access the content, again, most of it was, was um, done online, but um, for, the, for the SMS system, um, for the ones who have feature phones, they would receive messages on their, on their, on their phones, um, on their feature phones, because um, we, the WhatsApp content is useful for someone who's using smartphones, but um, this content can also be accessed on SMS. So we would use our database. During COVID, we did a lot of care package distributions. Um, initially, when I think between March, April, and May, um, we did a lot of care package distributions. So the people who received care packages we would take their contact details and put them on our database. So they would continuously receive messages from SOMO, whether it's to access the content or to register for our, our training programs. Excellent, thank you very much. And uh, Jessica, um, would you be able to share your program about uh, your, your question <clears throat> around describing who, who the entrepreneur supports are? Sure. Hi. So thanks for the presentation. First of all, um, I was wondering um, at which stage are the entrepreneurs that you support? So regarding their um, yeah, um, revenue and market um, establishment, etc. Yeah. Um, for our Buruka program, we take from idea stage. Um, some have uh, young businesses 
most of them under two years, but we take both idea stage and existing business. For our boost space program, where it's the smaller um, entrepreneurs who maybe are not impact entrepreneurs, we, we take only existing businesses. So yeah, there are some who we definitely start from the beginning with that. Lorene, so the, some at the beginning, and then what kind of, so you, an impact entrepreneur might have how many staff how many thousand how many thousand dollars in turnover uh, a year and, and same for the Baraka program it varies but a lot of them won't be above a, a, a thousand us dollars a month yeah so usually that range between a thousand to two thousand if it's really high it's like two thousand five hundred okay great so about ten to twenty thousand dollars a year in annual in revenue um for those and that is that the impact entrepreneur or that's the uh the the training content entrepreneur no no, no sorry not ten thousand usd i'm missing a zero um i've added a zero it's a hundred usd not a thousand yeah okay okay yeah great so they're, they're quite and their stage of formality are they are they sort of inform relatively informal when you work with them and and what proportion do yeah you most quite informal in fact when they get into our accelerator is when um we take them through the process of being legally registered uh being tax compliant and all that so a lot of them are quite informal um rarely will you find someone who's fully fully registered and is tax compliant so by the time we are signing a contract with them to join our accelerator we we do that before we sign um the contracts with them and and great um, thanks for that. There's a there's a question here from Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy, could you could you describe it? Uh, unmute yourself. Describe it, and and also um, be specific on on which tool that you're uh, that you're referring to. Hello. Hi. Hello. Oh, I mean the recording too. He talked about that they used to capture the financial transactions. Um, how do you guys adapt it to the, the different uh, business types, considering the fact that each business may require a peculiar tool to capture efficiently the um, business, the activities or the business transactions? How do you adapt the two to um, to different or various business types? Okay, yeah, yeah, so thank you for that uh, question. So uh, you find that uh, before we developed the tool, we already had an existing uh, format that we used for the cash flows because of course someone has been working with uh, different businesses, uh, some in manufacturing, some uh, service businesses. We find that we had already created the format for that tool. We lost Charles. Yeah, I think we lost Charles. Maybe Amelia can take it up. Oh, you oh, here? Okay. Are you? Can you go oh. on? Yeah. Yeah, I can go on. Uh, yeah. So uh, over, over 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 the time, some of course have been working with different businesses, maybe service businesses, uh, manufacturing businesses, uh, product businesses. So uh, over, over that time, we developed the cash flow at least to suit uh, generally most of the businesses that we work with. So when it came now to creation of the tool, it was more of now converting uh, the method of input into the existing cash flow. So it's just like providing them with a way to be able to update uh, their cash flow without necessarily now going to the Google Sheets to be able to update. So the tool was just using like an input, uh, an input path uh, for updating the cash flows, which had already been created, yeah. And Charles, just could you, what's the what's the uptake of the tool been like? Uh, come up again on that. So how many people, how many of entrepreneurs are using the tool? Oh, so currently we have over a thousand uh, entrepreneurs using the tool. Yeah, so we have some from the SOMOS portfolio, and then we have uh, external 
So what we're trying to, uh, to get is in terms of now at least uh, just trying to find out the difference in terms of for those who receive the training, how are they responding? Also, what's the difference between now those who've never received any training and then they have the tool? Uh, yeah, just like the different categories. So that is also what we are also trying to get from the entrepreneurs. Yeah. Wow, it sounds like it's been phenomenal uptake already and that there's some interesting questions there you're looking at around um, engagement with it, uh, uh, depending on the level of training they've received. Um, I see there's also a question from Daniel. Daniel, I'm just going to carry that question to the end because I, I want to hand over to Balloon Ventures now. So, so far we've had uh, Pablo describe Bridge for Billions approach and how they've really been digital first. Somo have described how they've moved uh, from a primarily in-person training to, to really deploying a lot of digital tools. Um, and now, Josh, over to you. Um, tell us about Balloon Ventures. Tell us about the role that digital uh, delivery plays in, in, in your program and what you've learned along the way. Thanks, Harry. And uh, hi, everyone. Great to be here with you today. Um, so as a brief introduction, my name is Josh, as Harry mentioned, and I'm one of the co-founders of Balloon Ventures. Um, so we're a social enterprise working in Kenya and Uganda, and our focus is really small and growing businesses that typically employ 10 to 30 people um, working in traditional brick and mortar industries. So low fee private schools, clinics, small hotels, um, small scale agro-processing. So, you know, the really common businesses that, that you see on the street, but those that have kind of stepped outside of the micro stage and are be beginning to grow. Um, and we believe that, that these businesses have really huge potential to grow and become you know, the engine of good job creation. Because at the moment, most, most um, employment is informal and quite poor quality. However, these businesses get stuck um, and they don't grow. So at Balloon, our goal is to try to get them unstuck. Um, so firstly, one of the things these businesses need is access to capital. Um, they're often deemed too high risk by current providers. So we provide loans of uh, about ten thousand to fifty thousand um, dollars. The second thing is that these businesses are defined by very informal management practices, um, so this often limits growth. And so we work intensively with them through one-to-one -one consulting um, in a really person-to-person-intensive -per way that I'll explain later to try and fix and formalize management. Um, and then thirdly, there's there's roughly you know eight point eight million of these high potential SGBs in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so our goal is, is to make this model financially viable, which means businesses paying for our services. Um, and for us, financial viability is critical because to unlock, you know, the really massive amounts of capital that are required to serve these customers, there needs to be a sustainable model there. Um, so we've been doing this for three years. We're not there yet, but we're currently at 55% sustainability. Um, we've grown our revenue a thousand percent in the last two years, and we have 51 clients. So we're kind of hoping to break even next year. Um, in terms of our digitalization pathway, uh, you know, as defined by the report, I'd say we're currently in the enhanced category. So we have a real focus of kind of offline services, face-to-face -face delivery, um, but we're beginning to explore more digital services to create efficiency, as I'll explain below. Um, and I think our long-term vision is to have a kind of a high-touch, high-tech model that uses person-to-person -person interaction to really drive behavior change, which is our focus but then to, to supplement that um, with technology so that we can create efficiencies and try and do this as, you know, as cheaply as possible to achieve scale. Um, maybe I'll explain a bit about our journey to give some more context. So I said, we've been doing this model for three years, but Balloon actually started in 2011. And initially we were delivering um, large volunteer programs for the UK government. And our focus was really micro businesses. Um, and for Balloon personally, we noticed a huge step forward when we moved from paper to digital processes. So suddenly, for example, things like assessment days of entrepreneurs, we could see all work that was being done live by, st by staff, knowledge was being accurately stored. Um, we could analyze data and make smarter decisions. Um, and also really importantly, processes could be changed almost instantly, right? You could just change a form and suddenly people were working to that new process. So when we pivoted to this new model, of doing larger investments and longer term support. We were focused on um, still being internally very tech enabled. But I think we've had a very different approach when we were thinking about it from the entrepreneur facing work. Um, and so our assumption was, and maybe still is, is that 
it, it's hard to get technology to stick, especially in the segment that we're working with. Um, we'd had some experiences actually at Balloon on another project building um, an, an e-learning entrepreneurship platform that's called Validate Startup. Um, and so we knew how hard it was to get entrepreneurs to use self-service technology. Um, and also on our kind of previous programs, we tried basic stuff like, you know, WhatsApp peer groups, WhatsApp mentoring, um, you know, honestly, probably with limited success. So I think coming to this new model, um, our thesis was that the key to really growing these small businesses was in behavior change. So yeah, we'd spent years doing, you know, fairly traditional stuff like offering training on financial record keeping. And then we'd see probably less than 5% of businesses adopt these practices. And so I think the failure here was that like we assume with training that the core problem is a knowledge deficit, but actually the entrepreneurs that we work with, I think most of them, they don't see an issue in how they're running the businesses. You know, they've maybe scaled to 10 or 20 people. So they're, they're doing very well. Um, and also, you know, informal business culture is very dominant and there's big incentives to remain informal. Um, you know, things like reducing costs, reducing tax liability. So our, our view was, you know, training won't fix this and the focus needs to be behavior change um, and creating a motivation for this change. I think our next hypothesis was that behavior change requires very deep trust, which can't be done digitally. It can only be done through lots of face-to-face -face work. And so the initial six businesses that we supported in this, in this model, we probably invested, you know, 500 plus hours of face-to-face -face time with each one. And we knew that that wouldn't be able to scale. But what we thought is let's try and solve this in a labor intensive way and then learn what works and strip out the, the inefficient parts. Um, so that was you know, 36 months ago when we started. We probably started thinking more about technology, I'd say 18 months ago. And similarly to what Charles and Summer were saying, you know, financial record keeping is the obvious place um, where you start. So, you know, we built like custom Excel tools, you know, modified paper records, but we just couldn't get it really to stick. Um, but at the same time, we, we, we saw entrepreneurs asking for more financial um, visibility. So there were common worries about money going missing. They wanted to delegate, you know, they were in the business 24 seven and they wanted to step back. Um, and so, yeah, in a pilot very kindly funded by Gideas, we wanted to test if we could install financial software in these businesses and if it would deliver value. Um, so we chose two local solutions. So a solution developed in Kenya and a solution developed in Uganda. And we, we tested it with 13 companies um, of which 10 are still using it and showing great results. But what I would say is that the process wasn't easy and, and still required a big time commitment. Um, so firstly, you know, we needed to get the business owner and the staff using the technology on board. There was then two days of training and setup. For some, you know, we had to buy the hardware, so computers or smartphones. Um, for others, we had to supply internet data uh, because you know, they wouldn't have Wi-Fi in the business. Also, many of the entrepreneurs and the staff that, you know, they're not, they weren't using many apps or digital tools. And so there was ongoing coaching that was needed. Um, and I think maybe what sometimes we, we forget is that, you know, technology requires people to use it. And so in a kind of high staff turnover environment, if you train someone and they leave, the process would have to start again. Um, you know, we would then follow up with daily check-ins initially, then weekly to check data quality. Um, we would, you know, do not, like nudges, offering small bonuses for bookkeepers that were using it well. Um, again, building on, on what Charles was saying, we had to customize the software in places. So schools require something slightly different from healthcare businesses. Um, so it wasn't easy, but I think despite the challenges, what we're now seeing is that it, it has stuck and that um, the data and the quality that we're seeing is far superior than anything that existed before. And when you start to digitize records, you can start to do other really exciting things. Um, so, so we decided, you know, to bear the cost of this internally and to roll it out to all the portfolio going forward where they don't have, um, you know, cloud accounting or digital financial records. I think that, so that was our initial kind of foray into this. We're now exploring two other kind of digital solutions which I think is still focused on this, this visibility and accountability angle, um, which is critical to us, but also is critical to the entrepreneurs as these businesses grow. Um, so the first is, is digital checklists. So we're currently piloting this in four businesses. So here basically, you know, standard operating procedures. So, you know, daily checklists are converted into digital lists, which the staff then access through their, their smartphone. 
um, and there are evidence with photos and uh, kind of other answers that you can choose, which is quite similar to how a lot of large food chains run their franchise businesses to kind of create that visibility. Um, so there's initial, I think, excitement here in the business owners in terms of having remote visibility of what's going on in their business. Again, they kind of feel like they can start to step back from it. They don't have to be there 24 seven for things to get done. And you start to have interesting data and trends on kind of what's being done. So if you have that visibility of the financial records and then visibility over kind of operations, you start to, to create really good, I think, productivity growth in a business. Again, it's not easy. You know, we've had to invest significant time here. Um, we've gone through three different technology providers for the digital checklists, still trying to find the kind of right one with the finance software. Again, we're like, we, we, we're still kind of exploring to see if there's a better option. Um, and then the third one in, in another Argidius funded pilot, we're working with, with 60 decibels to build, um, simple SMS surveys to create benchmarks around job quality in, in different sectors in East Africa. Um, so for example, we have around 800 employees in, in our portfolio of businesses, and it's, it's not possible to speak to them, you know, directly and hear from them and hear their voices and their experience. So we also think that technology has great potential here, um, again, to make impact more transparent, more actionable, and also give business owners honest data on things like staff satisfaction and morale. So that's a, a project we're going to be starting, um, next month. So just, I think probably to conclude, um, I think like our challenge is to scale a model that we believe will always be uh, based on kind of intensive face-to-face -face work to build trust and behavior change, but thinking about where we can leverage and bring in technology to improve that impact. So whereas maybe before we were doing a five or 600 hours of face-to-face -face work with these businesses, now, you know, we can achieve that same impact in 50 or hundred hours. And if the businesses are paying for these services, then you know, any hour spent that doesn't create impact for them is wasted money. Um, although I think as Balloon, we're also starting to think that eventually, like once we have a really good idea of what the technology or technologies are, it's something that we might have to build ourselves. Um, and I, I say this because I think the businesses that we see in this segment have quite specific needs that we haven't really managed to meet from off the shelf services that we've bought. Um, the first thing is it needs to be extremely low cost. So, uh, you know, a lot of these platforms, if you're charging $30 per month per user, you know, for 15 members of staff is simply not viable for business with, you know, five, $10,000 turnover. Um, you know, internet is still an issue. Really, it should be one of our team in Uganda here presenting today, but our office internet is, you know, so patchy. So these, these systems, they need to work perfectly offline, um, but still sync online so it can store data in the cloud. I think they need to be designed for you know, non-digital natives. So people that aren't using lots and lots of smartphone apps already don't have big trust in technology. I think reliability is another key one, you know, where people don't have trust in technology. If things aren't working perfectly from the beginning, that trust degrades. Um, a lot of the devices that people are using are you know, quite low performance devices in terms of technology. So things built you know, for the latest iPhone or you know, MacBook just simply don't work. And then data is expensive, so they need to use small amounts of data. And so, as I was saying, you know, we've tried to buy off the shelf stuff, but I think what we found is that, you know, solutions developed in places like Silicon Valley are often designed for a very different segment. Um, and I think with still local platforms, there's some exciting stuff happening, but I think the solutions still are too underdeveloped and underfunded, which creates a gap. Um, and so what I hope to see is that, you know, with the growth of things like no code platforms, you know, with the proliferation of coding knowledge with, you know, Charles and Summer building great stuff. I'd, I'd hope that, you know, Balloon wouldn't need to do that. And actually what we can continue to see is a, dem a democratization of technology um, that will fill this need. Uh, so that's a kind of whistle stop tour of Balloon's digitization journey. Thanks for listening. Josh, thanks so much for, for describing um, the, the, the role that that that's playing. I've, I mean, it really came through your focus on, on behavior change and that with the segment of entrepreneurs that you work with in second tier cities uh, in, in East Africa, um, technology, there's, there's just logistical and functional challenges that, that compound problems uh, and that the sort of willingness to up to, to take on digital 
means is even quite different to what we were hearing about in Nairobi in the capital with, with the young entrepreneurs Soma are working with. Um, but that, you know, when it's when it's well chosen, what you're digitizing, it can really enhance that that in-person interaction that you do have by having great information at your fingertips. Um, Roland, uh, you've got a question there. Would you like to unmute yourself and, and, and ask Josh? Yeah, sure. Hey, Josh. <laughs> I think we might have talked about this before. Um, I mean, in general, it's there's, well, apart from what you guys do, there, there's other initiatives also that, that talk about installing financial software into a company to get better access to what's really financially happening to in, in, into a business. Um, but it's usually not enough. I mean, the question, the problem is not software. The problem is the allocation of actual data um, that needs to go in that system in a proper way to, to get actual decent reports out of that. So, so I, I would say rather than the software, the, the, the main problem is always about how do you control for what goes in to avoid that the same amount of bar garbage comes out. Yeah. Um, and, and it's... In our experience, I mean, we're similar to Balloon in the sense that we provide to A, we, we have a GA organization with an investor on the other hand. Um, yeah, we, we haven't found, and honestly, we, in our experience, we haven't seen that you can do that digital, that, that piece, that control piece to actually, um, then especially from an investor point of view, get access to reliable data. Yeah. Um... I think in terms of the technology, I think it, it needs to do the basics, right? So like it needs to be reliable. It needs to work well offline. Like it needs to sync. It needs to be affordable. So you, you need that like baseline of stuff just for it to be a kind of goer. I think that then the second question around, yeah, rubbish in, rubbish out. Um, I think the question is, you know, like why is it, why is it poor quality data? Um, is it because of a kind of misunderstanding in the business or is it, you know, are people deliberately reporting on it in, a, in that way? And so I think, again, I think from, for us, this all goes down to like behavior change. Um, there's some really good stuff. I think it's the Stanford Design Lab. You know, they talk about behavior changes. You need like motivation and ability. And when you have the two prompts work. And so like motivation for us is, you know, do the entrepreneurs want financial visibility? And if not, then obviously you're not going to get anywhere. But then secondly, do the staff that are, involved in this process do they also want to create visibility and so you need to kind of tackle those two and then in terms of ability you know like do they have time to do this do they have the skills have they had the training to do this um which is why it's you know for us it was very labor intensive it was it was initially like doing loads and loads of data quality checks um so the businesses were still running with paper records so you know every day we would log in to see if the data had been stored Every week we were doing kind of audits, comparing the paper records to the digital records. Um, like some of these platforms had like simple data quality checks built in. So, you know, like things like daily um, cash balances. So, you know, you could then go and count that and see, okay, it says there should be $3,000 in the bank. How much, you know, is actually in the bank. Um, and yeah, and then, and then picking up and, it, and picking up whether it issues it. And it probably took us, four months I'd say with businesses to like get them to the point where they were doing it and I think there's still some kind of prompting that's needed and you know on that journey three of them dropped out um you know like the healthcare business decided it didn't have the right functionality for them and I think two others we couldn't you know build the motivation but I think in those 10 even if we're doing those weekly checks even if it's taken us four or five months I think that that like what we get out of it is still so much better than like the two years we spent before like you know, building Microsoft Excel tools and paper records and all the kind of stuff, just because as soon as things goes digital, as soon as you have that kind of visibility, you can then start to be reactive about stuff. You don't have to wait two or three weeks to know that they're not keeping records or that the business is losing money. You can actually like start to go in and be proactive. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's why I think for us and the entrepreneurs, it's all about like visibility so that you can make those steps proactively and you don't need to be there face to face, you know, 24 7 to, to make, get things done but yeah it's a huge challenge I think and it's not that a technology solution is going to solve it it's like technology blended with the kind of 
in our view, the intensive person to person stuff. Maybe a quick follow on would you say there's there could be a difference between the informal businesses and then those that are kind of on the next level, semi formal or moving to, towards more more formal, formality? Yeah. Kind of, and I'm just thinking out loud that with the informal businesses, it, it could actually be an issue of behavior change, but with the semi to formal, uh, more formal business, I, I kind of always feel this, there's simply a natural tension field of wanting to under declare. I mean, the incentive not wanting to be uh, completely truthful, having double books, sometimes having triple books for the obvious reason is, is, is not going to be solved through. Yeah. I think a behavioral change approach. Um, I think that's a much broader public policy issue as well, right? It's like, yeah, we're going to solve that. That's that's on the governments of these countries and tax policy and things like that. Um, but but what we found is that there's a there's like a real sweet spot for our support. Um, you know, like where businesses need to be at the size that they're actually starting to feel these problems. So you know, we might work with a business with five or six people, and actually they can still run it in a really informal way because it's not big enough yet. And it kind of hits this tipping point where maybe it gets to 10, 15 people, things start to like speed up and they start to feel overwhelmed. Um, and I think it's like, it's catching businesses at the point you know, where they have that motivation that they want to change the way they do things. Yeah, because if people don't have motivation for do, to do stuff, then there's no ability to, to you know, create change. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's kind of our insight that there's a, you need to find them in that sweet spot and understand like, you know, why they want to do things in order to, get, you know, make technology a goer. Right. Thanks so much for that, um, for, for, for presenting Josh and, and great question, Roland. Um, Reiki, there's your question. I, I think we're at time. So um, perhaps this is a question you can take offline. Uh, okay, and, and that's answered. Um, but just before uh, Deborah wraps up, I'd just like to say thank you so much to Josh, Lorreen, um, uh, uh, um, um, Pablo, and um, <clears throat> um, and 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 Charles. Uh, thanks for generously sharing your your your, your journeys. Uh, thank you. I think you've already indicated that you're going to be very willing and, and, and happy to take any conversations offline. Um, so thank you and thanks very much, Deborah, for hosting us and thanks everyone for, for your questions. Thank you, Harry. So thank you everyone for joining today's session. It was a pleasure to listen to these three businesses. Um, it was a great morning session. Harry, thank you for, for bringing such impactful businesses to our session today and Paul, Pablo, Lorraine, Charles, and Joshua, thank you for sharing the insights. Um, we, anyone in the room today, if you know anyone in your network that could benefit from the services offered by these organizations, please make sure you connect them. Um, so, or if you know anyone that would value that contact, um, I'll be sharing their contact details in a follow-up email, along with link to the recording and um, the report. Um, we framed the topic today. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and I very much look forward to see you at another impactful breakfast session. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.